Hey guys, welcome to Electronic Dance Money, your number one business resource for making money as electronic musicians and producers. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to a brand new episode of Electronic Dance Money. I'm your host, Christian Casito, and we've got Mike back in the stew. What's up, Mike? How you doing? Yo, yo. I've never said that in my entire life. I don't know why I'm saying it now. <laughs> Dude, we had we were supposed to start 40 minutes ago, but we've been playing around with what app to use for fucking talk and hang out because your damn internet is dog shit why do you have such bad internet i it wasn't my choice the delay is insane man it's pretty crazy we got to get you new and we're just talking you gotta get a new modem start there because you are not getting what you're paying for and your your isp is fucking you over my guy so you need new at the very least at the very least you need a new modem Test that out. See how the test the waters there. And if that fixes your issues, then you're good to go. Otherwise, you're probably going to need to go with a new router. See, the, the horrible thing is, is the ISPs around here, it, it's only one. So it's not like we even have a choice. Yeah, that seems so, that seems so criminal. It's, it's, it's mind boggling that I, I, I actually reached out to Spectrum. Oh, so I know Spectrum has a contract on the neighborhood that I live in because it's a new build and they came around and they essentially won't allow other pe- other competitors to come in. I'm guar- I'm guessing it's a five year contract, which means it's up this year. And I was talking to Spectrum because I've had many Internet issues in this new house. And so I reached out to him. I was like, so when's your con? I know you guys have a contract on this area. When's your contract up so I can so I can go to a provider that's actually going to give me the service I pay for? And the chick I was chatting with was like, oh, Spectrum doesn't do that. They don't have contracts. I'm like, that's a blatant lie. You're just lying to me. I know that they have contracts on areas. Well, it's- they they don't know. They don't know. I mean, maybe I don't possibly who knows but if they're maybe you're right they should still be able to look up by zip code or neighborhood or where i'm at like they have my physical location based off of my ip address on my router and on my pc so it doesn't make sense whatever it does it, it's so stupid i hate internet companies it's the worst it is so it's so aggravating. I'm really hoping um, one either like fiber internet gets much better and they can put it in more places because that's going to solve a lot of these issues or Starlink becomes more accessible and uh, it actually works really well and you can get it in in cities because I know Starlink's really good for rural rural areas. But I don't, and I think they're only giving access to rural. Yeah, areas. because there's very few options out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So I think they're only giving access to rural areas at the moment. Anyways, this isn't an internet tech podcast. We're here to talk about um, how you, as a producer, can become a better producer, become better at music business. And so today we've got a great episode where we're going to be talking about the five tips that are going to help you become just a generally better producer overall in your entire career um yeah mike do you want to start off with the first one yeah the first tip is to get a real internet service provider that's tip number one we need great internet in order to be able to download our plugins much much faster (laughs) yeah like that 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 sample pack that's 14 gigs you know how long it takes me to download a 14 gig sample pack like six weeks, dude. I don't even want to know that, dude. It probably takes you three hours. It's insane. That would be ridiculous. That's that's generous. I'm not even lying. Well, I'm not. You know what? Ironically, this is not the first one at all. If any of you've guessed, but ironically, actually having a good internet is good because if it takes you three hours to download a sample pack, that's interfering with your actual writing and producing so 
maybe if you do have slow internet, you should figure that the fuck out and fix that as soon as possible. But on to actual number one. This one, I, I thought of this the other day, and this is really what made me think about this topic a lot. Um, you, as a producer, DJ, musician in the business, should have a spreadsheet with all the contact information of every person that is important to you, to your genre, to your brand, to your character. So, if you think about it, there's really three main groups that are included in this, um, I guess, grouping. And it's producers to collaborate with, it's promoters to contact, and it's labels slash a to record labels. So... They're all pretty self-explanatory, but when you really think about it, a lot of people don't do this because I guess it's just a waste of time to, in their mind. But you have to have people to collaborate with because you always want to make those collaborative jumps in music where you send a track that's pretty done or you know almost completed to somebody a little bit more exposed or more talented than you, um, and they can really propel you up a step or promoters you can contact when you're in a town looking for a gig you you say oh i know someone in boston who can book me and you're going to be in boston one week you can say hey uh so and so i'm going to be in boston this weekend if you have any open slots let me know i will play and we can arrange a deal or whatever and then finally labels and ours that's pretty self-explanatory you have a track that you think fits a label um definitely find someone there and you know build a relationship build rapport with them and that way you'll have either better feedback or more opportunity to really get into that label. Um, Christian, what do you have thoughts on those? Well, I think the first thing, especially with uh, producers to collaborate with, and you can even tie this into um, labels as well, but the biggest thing with when you're working with, if, you, if you're wanting to work with producers to collaborate with them and you're adding their names to spreadsheets, I think it's really, really important to stay up to date with the stuff that they're working on and releasing. Because there's a lot, you you never know if a producer from three years ago switches genres or styles and is going for a different vibe. And so if you have their contact information in there and it's two years old and you don't have a reference track, you may not have a good reference point. Or you do have a reference track of one of their tracks. It just gives you, if you're keeping up to date with that, you know, update it every year. It keeps you familiar with their music. Um, most of the time, these collaborators you're going to be working with aren't going to be, you know, if you're some producer that's put out three tracks before and they all have less than 3,000 streams on Spotify or hell, even less than like 50,000 streams on Spotify, you're not collaborating with Diplo, right? You're not going to send a track to Diplo if he's on that spreadsheet and be like, hey, I think this would work. Like, the people that are going to be on that spreadsheet are just a little bit further than you. Um, or they could potentially be a lot further than you, but you have a good relationship with them. Um, and if that's the case, it may be that you're following them on social media and you're even friends with them, but you're not necessarily constantly keeping up with their music all the time um, just based off of s circumstance. So it's always best to have a reference track of theirs within that spreadsheet that you can, if you're writing something, you go, oh, you know what? This actually reminds me of this producer. Um, let me go check that reference, see if it fits. Oh, it does fit? Okay, sweet. This would be a good track to actually reach out to them um, and, and see if they'd be interested on a collaboration. And you want to do the same exact thing with labels. You never know if a label is going for a different style after years and years of releasing a certain style. Um, even, Revealed's a good example. It Revealed's a, a really good example. Um, even if you have, uh, if you don't have collaborators necessarily on your spreadsheet or you're unsure of how to, um, connect with people you want to collab with a great way to do that is to, I mean, first get that, get that first label release wherever you're signing to, and then comb through the producers on there, comb through their recent releases. If they're releasing to bigger labels, if they're starting to get bigger, and add them to the producer collab uh, spreadsheet because that gives you an opportunity to immediately open the doors and get a response from them because you're label mates. Like you're on the same label and it's a great icebreaker. And if you have a track you want to collaborate with them on and you have something that's almost finished, it's perfect. But you need to 
make sure you're also updating that label spreadsheet and and that the tracks on there are current with what they're in the process of releasing with um for promoters it it's kind of tough you don't i would say if you're if you're wanting to book shows at certain venues and you're keeping logs of contacts at venues you know you've heard me talk about this in the past always make sure that if you don't have a direct relationship with the promoter or the owner of the venue or something like that, that the, those contacts should be the individuals that are connected with those promoters that you do have a relationship with. It's really hard to cold email a promoter who's never heard of you before and your analytics don't necessarily hold up to them wanting to even consider booking you. So the best way in with that is holding contacts that are contacts of the promoter that you have an established relationship with if you don't already have an established relationship with the venue owner or the promoter. Um, until you get to that point where you do have that face-to-face, -face, you can build that, uh, that relationship and expand upon that. It's best to keep those contacts of people that are already associated with those individuals and that you're starting to build a relationship with because they're the ones you're going to reach out to. They're the ones that are going to be able to say, to say, yeah, let me reach out to them, see if they have a show in three months when you're going to be in town or, or whatever, regardless of all that shit though, keeping a spreadsheet of ind spreadsheet, <laughs> keeping a spreadsheet of individuals, <laughs> of individuals that you, that you know, um, it, it's, it is, very it's not done by a lot of people i don't see that sort of thing happening I, I don't see producers as organized or as conscious of the people that they're talking to and building a relationship with um and having all their contact info you know their name their email their socials their phone number if you have it having all that stuff on hand just in case you lose your phone or whatever you like if you lose that contact in the device that you hold contacts in, it's best to have that stored somewhere, um, either in the cloud on like a Google sheet or even better yet on a Google sheet within your Dropbox vault. So it's locked behind something. Or I, I know within Dropbox, you can like create a spreadsheet within your vault. So that's locked information that no one else can get access to because, you know, you don't want, you don't want to be leaking people's information, especially if you're getting into contact with bigger and bigger people. So um, storing that stuff like it's a password is really good uh, just to cover your back. And, you know, if God forbid someone steals something of yours and they're in the industry and they want to read through all of your contacts to steal people's info, you don't want to be that person that that happens to everyone. So uh, making sure that you're backing that stuff up in something like Dropbox vault where it's locked behind passcodes and stuff. Um, it just guarantees your safety and other people's safety. But, um, regardless, the spreadsheet thing is, is super, 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 super valuable. Um, I know I keep a spreadsheet of all the people that I'm in relationship with, um, mostly individuals that I'm in contact with outside of Austin. Um, the people within Austin, I see them all the time every other weekend. Um, so if, if something were to happen, it's easy to contact them if I, if I don't have their number or whatever, but, uh, yeah, that's, I think it's a really, really good, really good, um, log to, to keep just in case you need it. Label emails too, you know, it, like promo emails are great. Um, it's it's really helpful actually to um have a list like this, just because I I know personally that when you're going through people to collaborate with, or going through labels to send your track to, or or just going through large lists and thinking processes of things where you can make a creative decision. Looking at a list really itemizes things and makes it easier to make a decision you won't forget about like you sent a track to five labels and you forgot about that one label you really really wanted to send it to and you thought it would fit perfect but you forgot about it in the moment it's really helpful to have everything all displayed in front of you and just have your options there so it's it's really a good way to help make decisions all right number two is start saving midi and samples from your own tracks and i really like this 
this thought process of um, there's something from the dojo we learned from Ill Gates, and he keeps what's called a purple cow folder. Uh, so I've talked about projects. I, I may have even talked about the purple cow folder long, long time ago, you know, two or three years ago, if not longer. But, you know, when you're when you're trying to template out your time or manage your time and I've talked about having specific sessions for like sound design or where you're just practicing, right? You're messing around with different plugins, messing around with different melodies and just trying to um, either get yourself in the zone of writing, become more creative or get more comfortable with a music theory process. There's a great thing you can start doing with this idea in mind. It's a little bit different than just physically saving MIDI or samples, but you can still do that within the same process. But if you have a really cool, weird, you know, baseline that you're working on that's eight bars long and it's just weird and just you're experimenting and fucking around, export that out as a wave and throw that in what's called your purple cow folder. Purple cow is like it's a weird thing. It's just a weird folder filled with weird ideas that you can pull up anytime as a wave file, throw it into a project if you think it fits, manipulate it, chop it up, do weird things with it. Um, but this goes you can go further than this and take MIDI, right? If you've got a good melody, but you just feel like, you know, I haven't found the right sound for this. I want to keep the MIDI, MIDI, export the MIDI and keep that in your purple cow folder or a different folder, however you structure that sort of stuff. Um, and then obviously, you know, taking your favorite samples from projects or even sampling stuff. So uh, I had a friend over. Her name's Nichelle. I think I'm going to be getting her on the podcast soon, but she goes by Laruk, L-E-R-R-U-I-Q. I'm so sorry if I'm butchering that, Nichelle. I really do apologize, but um, I'll, I'll have her content. I will have her like pages, social pages in the um, in the show notes for you guys to check out. She's a fantastic producer, but she was over last night. And I've got this hardware synth called a virus TI and I haven't, I got, I got the hardware synth way too early on in my production career. And so it was way too much for me to try to understand and mess around with. And just, I always put it off to the side and never messed around with it. Um, up until recently within the last year or two, I've been getting much, much, much more comfortable with sound design, sound synthesis understanding how LFOs work, how you can automate LFOs to different tools, whatever you're doing. And so she was coming over. I told her, hey, I've got hardware synth. Let's just let's let's mess around with that. So we hung out for a couple of hours then broke that out and started playing around with it. And we were just making weird stuff, just really obscure, weird sounds that sound cool and adding different processes to it with an Ableton and just just messing around, just experimenting. And this was a great opportunity to be like, there's so much within this hardware synth that we can just sample, like taking clips out of it, sample it, throw it into a project, chop it up, do whatever we want to it. There's a bunch of different drum loops within the hardware synth. So you just draw out like a four, eight bar note and you just have it play. And it has all these drum hits hitting right on the tempo that you want. And so, you know, exporting out a wave of that, cutting out the snare, putting that in your sample in your sample library is a great way of of this this specific tip in action of taking something obscure, different. You know, other people are not going to have it, especially with this hardware synth that they stopped. They stopped making this version of it, um, I think, three or four years ago. Uh, I, I know they have the desktop version, but I don't know if the patches are all the same. They could, they may not be, but the, I know there's a limited amount of people that actually have viruses because it's not a super, super well-known hardware synth. And so taking something like the drum loops in that, cutting out the kick, cutting out the snare, cutting out the hats and using that in a project is a really, really great way to start sampling things that you're working on. And throwing that in something that you can use later on that you know no one else is really gonna even have to use. Yeah, I would tend to agree. Um, by the way, guys, I found out why my internet's so shit. Oh yeah. Where Steam was downloading just everything I owned 
in the background. Bruh, dude. I haven't even no opened Steam. No wonder why. I haven't even opened Steam since my computer started. It's not supposed to start on startup, so. Dude, you gotta, you gotta turn off automatic updates. It, it's I the worst. I never have. It's, it's terrible. Dude, I'll be working on something if I haven't. It starts downloading a 15 gig update and it just kills everything. I'm like, what the hell is going like, on? This is, this is a different podcast already. This is a different podcast <laughs> de- already. The delay is completely gone now. <laughs> yeah, dude, I watched my download speeds. My res- my reception was like a kilobyte per second. Jesus. Oh, man. Well, it's nice to be back and alive. Um, I'm glad that this is fixed. But on this topic, on, you know, saving MIDI and samples from your tracks, every track I do, uh, probably since uh, my my last release on Storytime, Feel Your Heart with Mark Woods, shout out, um, I've saved my baseline MIDI, my lead MIDI, my chords MIDI from every track. And that way, like, if I ever find myself stuck in, in a hole and I just can't create something, I'll create... A melody and i'll drop the chords in from another track and then i'll transpose and change chords and see what works and really it just helps push the um the the process it, it drives the process a little bit more and even more so on my track with audio prism all we've got we had a melody that was nothing like the final product i i posted a tiktok about it and the initial melody was it was not great it was very very weird but what David ended up doing was chopping the melody up that we had saved and realigning it into a totally different pattern by chopping the actual MIDI and just rerouting it. And it came out to be one of my most played tracks. And it it was a melody that you would never think of in the moment. So it's really cool to have stuff like that. Um, Another cool thing is you can save like master chains and, you know, all your effects chains that you think you'll never ever use again, you probably will. Let's be real. Well, in saving uh, different chains, and this is going to speak a lot to you Ableton users, you know, having different racks saved within your project that you can just you can just pull in and adjust. If you have a really really great track and you have a an extensive processing chain on your baseline that really makes it groove and give it this great element. Saving that chain and pulling into something else and just adjusting parameters, you can get the same vibe that sounds a bit different. One of the things that um, Noah's actually taught me, my buddy Noah Neiman, if you're new, I've got an episode with him. Can't remember the number. It'll be in the show notes. Um, He goes by Dr. Neiman. Really awesome dude. He came over over the weekend, was helping me out with a track and showed me part of his process. And one of the things that he actually did, He's told me this for years, what he does, the way he's able to crank out tracks as fast as he does is every track he writes is essentially the template of the track before it, or it's a template that he's been using from years and years ago. And the template is the actual saved project itself. So he has the entire outline done. The breaks are where they always are. The drop is where it's always at. Um, the, the baselines are always in the same spot and they're all written out with all the MIDI and he goes in, he'll change the key. He'll, you know, pitch up or transpose snares or kicks. If he needs to, he'll adjust the melodies. He'll change the sounds. And essentially it's just the whole thing is already done. He just has to go in, change MIDI, change sounds. And he has a, basically a completely finished track. And one of the biggest takeaways I got from that session is, is the, the, kick that I was using and was it the snare too? No, it it wasn't the snare. It was the kick that I was using within the project. I was like, I found this kick. It's fucking phenomenal. It's the best drum and bass kick that I found yet. Um, I was like, I suck with my kicks. I need to find better kicks. And he's like, dude, use the kick again. Fuck it. Like no one's going to know that you've used the same kick in the last three tracks. Like unless you're just a completely audio nerd freak that like you're analyzing every sample even then those people are so few and far between and if they have a problem with it who cares they're not necessarily the people that are listening to your to your music to enjoy it the people that are listening to your music to enjoy it are mostly the fans of electronic music they're not the producers and they're not going to know the difference between one kick sample in one track and another kick sample in another track 
Um, and especially if you're working in a different key, you're transposing that kick up or down, you totally change the sound of it, but you're keeping all the initial elements of that kick, you know, the sustain of the kick, the transient of the kick, all of those little elements within the actual kick itself. All right, we're back after a quick little, you guys did. I hope you guys did not notice anything, but my DAW just happened to loop to the beginning of the recording and just fucked everything up, <laughs> but we're back, baby. Um, we're having all sorts of technical issues. You with your shitty internet and steam and me with my shitty looping in Cubase, which I still do all my episodes in Cubase, but I work in Ableton now. Yeah, except except yesterday you were working in Cubase for an unknown project. Um, but what I was going I to say, that old ass that old ass project. That I'm we'll see if I can project. revive it. I cannot get the sound to be where I want. That yeah, shit is old, some time. old, old. Um, another thing with reusing kick samples, if as long as you're not producing like minimal house or even like just as long as the kick is accented by different bases it will fundamentally be different like very few people will notice it especially in drum and bass um there's just i would not be able to pay that much attention to the the kick drum in a drum and bass track i can barely pay attention to it in like a piano house track let's be real i'm lucky i'm a dj <laughs> 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 yeah, but I mean, like, if, if you have a favorite snare, if you have a favorite kick, don't let that hold yourself back from being like, oh, I already used that in the last track. That becomes your Fuck style. That. that becomes yeah, you. Who cares? Yeah, who cares? Use it again. No one's going to fucking know. If it sounds good, it sounds good. That's all that people give a shit about. Someone's gonna, not going to listen to it and be like, oh, they already used this kick again. I'm not listening to this song. I don't like if If. If there's anyone out there like that that's listening to your music, you don't want them to listen to your music. Who cares about appeasing them? Use the same shit over again, sample wise. Um, because if it's good and you like it, then fucking use it. Who cares? Whatever. I mean, the entirety of Progressive House for like eight years was the same exact lead, pretty much just every track for eight years. Big Room, dude, Big Room for fucking two or three years. It was the same exact big saw. In every single track in 2013, if you scrolled through all of the like at the time, I can't even remem remember what the genre was. I think it was just listed as progressive house. But if you scroll through all of the top 100, it was the same tracks over and over and over again, all using the same Zenheiser samples, all using the same big saws from Serum or, or like the Massive. black, black like octopus it was, packs. It was it was all the same. Um and stylistically that gets a little different you know because you can only use the same key every single time like g minor you can only yeah, use g the minor same midi minor. pattern every yeah the whole, the same midi pattern over and over and they were all like the same midi pattern just like spaced differently R the rhythms were slightly different but um yeah, saving all of those elements that you love in your pro projects, whether it be MIDI, whether it be sampling things, whether it be individual samples you use over and over again, if you know it works, you can throw it in. You don't have to think about it. But if you have to sit there and search through 300 kicks and you spend 10 minutes doing that and you still at the end of the day go, fuck, I don't like this kick. Well, now you got to like go back over that. It's just it's just going to slow you down. Your production's not going to be as good. But if you know these three kicks always bang, I'm always going to use those. You know you can throw it in. You know you can use it. You know it's going to work. Speeds up your process. Makes you sound more like you. And it makes your tracks more original and, and, and better overall. Yeah. I mean, that's really the, the core of it all. You want to jump into number three? Yeah. So number three, I think, is something I realized pretty recently. Um, ever since I moved out to... You know, near Philly, I, I kind of learned that it's so important to ingratiate yourself in the music scene. And I think every time I'm on, I talk about this, but I think it's just it's something you need to understand as a musician in order to get gigs, in order to build your your community. Um, you have to, you know, ingratiate yourself into the scene. I mean, just last weekend, a bunch of my buddies in Philadelphia, they rented out a venue 
and they were throwing a a party. They got a big headliner um, to come out from the Midwest, and they all opened for them. They threw their own party. They throw this party like two times a year. It's a huge event. Like it sells out every year. So I promoted it for them. Got some free tickets, and I mean, just to just to make some moves. You know, it's all really important to just create the name that you are from this city or that city. I mean, you do it in Austin now um, with your recent adventures. So it's, it's really important and it just helps you get so much further along the way, even though it seems like a lot of work, it's just going out and hanging out. Like just have a couple drinks, maybe buy someone a drink every once in a while and it's just partying. That's it. There's a big difference between there's there's two different artists that you're going to find in your local scene. There are people who are not very well connected locally with fans and friends. And then you're going to find DJs that go out all the time. I shouldn't say all the time. I don't think that's like an appropriate. You shouldn't be going out all the time, right? There, there's There's times where you need to stay home and work on shit. But There's a difference between a DJ who is in their studio 24-7 or at home 24-7 playing video games, uh, doing anything other than going out and socializing within the local scene. And those DJs that do go out, they do socialize. They do have friends that aren't necessarily producers, but just fans. And the difference between the DJ who stays home all, all the time and the DJ that goes out and socialize is that they pull heads. They they have people to reach out to to say, I'm playing this show on this date, and they can guarantee that they're going to have 30 people come out. And when you can fill up a room as an opener, or you know, maybe not fill up a room, but like get people there to see you when the doors open, you know, there's a line outside. LaRouk is one who, uh, you know, Nichelle, who I just mentioned before, she's one of those individuals who has a lot of friends that are fans of the music and they will go out. She's, she's very sociable. She's likable. She's a great human. And she, she can fucking send out a message to X amount of people or even make a post on social media. And people just come out because they want to come see her and support her. And if you're not out socializing, I'm not saying you have to do this every single night. I'm not saying you have to do it every single weekend. But at least go out enough to meet other DJs, meet other producers, get introduced to their friends who will then introduce you to their friends and their friends will introduce you that like it will cascade from there. And if you're working on all these relationships and listen, you don't have to hang out with every single one of these people every week or be talking to them every single week. That's too that's too much to try to handle. But if you know they like a certain style of music. And you know that they will be going out to shows. Well, it's pretty easy to anticipate this artist is coming into town. I should go to that show. And you're probably going to run into those people again. And when you run into them, that gives you that opportunity to have that one on one time to talk with them, to hang out um, and and get to know each other and and build off of that relationship. Buy them a drink. And this is just going to influence that relationship and establish a better base and foundation of that relationship, which is then going to allow you to reach out to them when you do have a show and say, Hey, I'm playing on this day. And they will then start coming out to support you. So getting out, socializing, enjoying the music, buying people drinks, being introduced to other individuals that are friends of other producers of yours or other DJs, that is like the foundational basis of going out and establishing yourself in the local scene, getting people to know who you are, what your name is, what you do, why you like making music, and that will influence them to want to come out and actually see you and support you as well. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty good summarization of it. Uh, I I think I would agree in every way. Um, I do disagree that you don't even have to go out that frequently at all. I mean, there are times of the year where I'll go to a show a month. There are other times of the year I'll go to two or three shows a month. It's really all about playing playing the hands right, right? So if you go to a, a really big show with a lot of people, you have to make a lot of connections. 
if you go to a really like niche show and a, a smaller crowd, you can make connections, but those connections might be more foundational, might be more tightly bonded, I guess, because those people are probably more invested. Like the everyday crowds, they're not always easy to work with and they're not always easy to appeal to. But with that being said, they're also a little bit easier to read, I feel like. So I think the best shows for you to go to are the ones where you could like if you're trying to establish this fan base or get local um, fans of the music on your side and wanting to support you and come out to the shows that you are going to open up open for. The best shows, because listen, this is all about what we're talking about here in this part of it is the time management aspect that that Mike's bringing up. Like if you're going out to a show every two days, you're now lacking on the studio side of you being able to interact in the studio, get better sounds, get better samples, write better tracks, work on melodies, all that stuff. If you're going out constantly, you're not going to have the time to do that. If you're going out constantly, you're not going to have money to spend on your marketing. Like there, there's there, there's a push and pull to all of this, and you have to understand that. And so, if you have to limit your time and you have to deal with time management in the aspect of going out and socializing, which you should, you should be conscious of your time management of how many shows you're going out to, how much money you're spending. All of that should be on your mind when you're going and doing these things. The best shows for you to go to, if this is what you're thinking about about getting fans to come support you at a show, then you should be going to the shows where your friends are opening up for other artists, where your friends that are DJs or producers, they're opening up a show or their direct support because you know that their friends are going to be there and you'll be able to talk to your friend who's playing the show and their friends will be surrounded, will be surrounding them as well. And they're going to then introduce you to everyone. And that gives you the opportunity to, you know, maybe you're not going to talk with every single person, right? If they bring 30 people, you're not going to be hanging out with all 30 people, but you may find one or two throughout the night that you hit it off with, and they may be, may be friends with the other three or four people that are there. Um, and so that, like, that influences those people for when you invite that person out, they're going to then bring those three or four people. Exponential but impact. Exactly, exactly. Um, regardless finding those one or two people that you hit it off with that's your opportunity to establish a good relationship that night to buy them a drink to to learn who they are what they enjoy and just build the relationship from there follow them on Instagram they'll follow you TikTok whatever but if you have to limit your the amount of shows that you go to per week or per month which you should the best ones to go to are going to be the ones where your friend is opening or your friend is supporting someone doesn't you know the best shows to go to aren't necessarily the biggest names that are coming into town and you just don't know anyone that's on the show or anyone that's going to be there you might be able to talk to people but you're 100 percent right mike it, it's it's not easy to just like start talking to someone yeah and- random conversation in clubs although it comes easy to my inner demon it does not come easy to normal people. No, and it's just it also it just doesn't feel right because you don't know the the headspace that that person's in. Like they may just want to be there to enjoy the show. They don't want to talk to anyone. But when you're going out and supporting a friend who's opening, all of their friends are down to talk to pretty much anyone that's related to the your mutual friend that's opening the show or playing the show. So it's just the the anxiety or the pressure that the social pressure that's put on to talk to new people kind of leaves the room when you have a mutual acquaintance there that can introduce you to and you can start talking uh you want to jump on number four for us yeah so this is the this one's this one's uh, it might be my favorite right now Sound design is fucking everything that I'm I, I'm really, you know, I've known this for years and many of you probably know this, but I, I really want to put a big fat exclamation point on this on this whole topic of sound design. Sound design is like the best thing that you could be working on right now to level yourself up as a producer. If you want to stick out from the crowd, if you want to be different and interesting. Sound design is where your focus should be. You should have multiple dedicated sound design sessions per week. 
especially if you don't understand understand sound design um like that should be a big 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 focus of yours is understanding sound design get to a point where you can design 10 sounds in an hour or more and that's what's going to expedite the process of you being able to feel more unique the best track that i've written to date is the one that i was working on with noah that i sent to you mike i sent in the discord itself and it everything is so well rounded in that track and just about every single sound, except for two sounds, are ones that are designed by myself, by me. And they are very unique. They're different. They don't sound like anything else that's really out on the market. And, and that is the difference between you sounding like everyone else and you developing your own thing, is being able to just on the whim, open up a plugin, start fucking around with sounds, come up with something interesting and different, and use that in a project. Not every sound you design is going to be a banger. I've designed probably well over 100 or 200 sounds. And out of that, I maybe have 10 that are really good, that are well developed. Um, The other thing to think about, too, which I've found to be a major, major part in how you sound is the processing that you're doing on the sound. So it's not just the basis of the sound. FX are important. They're, They're everything. They're everything from getting a distinct sound. So even if you aren't doing sound design, and you have presets, like process the fuck out of those sounds in such a weird and interesting different way that it sounds different than the bass sound. It sounds so different that no one could point it back to any one person um, or any sound pack that you actually got it out of. That's really the big key when you're working with sounds as well is the processing that you're doing. But if you want to really push the envelope for your music, it's all going to come down to the sound design if you get so comfortable that you can bust out sounds like no one's business and they all sound fucking fantastic sweet try fucking around with developing your own samples but i would say like unless you love making samples and you've been doing it for years don't worry about samples as much you have splice there use splice it's not a big deal but i think what's more important but aside from everything else is the sound design aspect of just working in the studio, busting out sounds as much as you can and utilizing those sounds in your own projects. There's nothing more exciting than making a banger track with a sound that you designed. Hell yeah. I I totally agree with that too. Like I think honestly, most of my tracks, I just preset search because you just got to find a preset and you got to tweak it slightly and just make it your own. Like, I know a lot of people who will just go and they'll open up Nexus, they'll open up Dance Piano 2K7, and then that'll be the entire track. And then I'll open Nexus, I'll open Dance Piano 2K7, I'll throw a flanger on it, and bam, I just landed spinning records. (laughs) I don't know about that, Mike, but good on you. (laughs) But if you're, you know, if you're struggling with the sound synthesis stuff and understanding sound design, best thing you can do is to one look up sound design tutorials don't let that be your crutch for everything like experiment but if you're trying to figure out the foundational things of how lfos work or how you manipulate different things like an fm because you know a lot of people in serum they'll throw an fm but they don't realize you know what you want to actually do is turn the volume completely down on the thing that you're trying to fm to so like there's there's subtle things that you should be doing that and also you know adjusting the pitch of the sound that you're pulling the fm from that can completely alter everything that you're doing there there there's specific techniques that are more advanced that are that that you may not realize that if going through a tutorial all of a sudden you learn something new and the next day when you open up serum and you start messing around with new sounds you can take those concepts and apply them in different ways all of, all of a sudden you have something super unique um taking some of those presets and back engineering them reverse engineering them right so you go through start turning knobs down that were turned up hear what what happens turn it back up oh, okay that's what that's doing like completely reverse engineering or trying to build a sound from a preset that you already have that all is going to help you figure out what things do, how they work and why they work in a certain way. And it's just going to uh, like 
ingrain your foundation of of sound synthesis and sound design in a much deeper and meaningful way. Let me tell you, the day you learn the difference between unipolar and bipolar on Serum is the day your sound design changes forever. <laughs> Everyone's going to YouTube and looking that up right now as we speak. <laughs> yeah, it took me like a solid three years to even figure out how to change that. I mean, sound design really makes a difference in who you are as a producer. It creates your sound, your identity, your brand, which ironically is the fifth tip. And uh, it's more of an overarching theme, but we'll start with the branding and the marketing. This is how you invest in your craft. And as an artist, they say in business, you have to spend money to make money. Now, that's not necessarily 100% accurate in every instance, but in my experience, I think it's pretty accurate as a musician. Um, there are tons of things you can invest in. You could spend money on. You could spend it on marketing for your tracks, advertising. You could spend it on mixing, mastering, any service that like a, an engineer can give you. You can spend it on live session musicians. You could spend it on vocals. There's so many options. You could spend it on ghost production. I don't give a shit what you do, bro. Just as long as you create, you know, create vibes. But you can pay for all your DJ sets that you play and they make you pay to play, but don't do that. That's, <laughs> that's not good. It, it's not, it's not the best, but yeah, like this is part of the reason why not going out too often or being at least being conscious of how often you're going out and how much you're spending and what you're spending on is very, very important. Um, one of the best quotes that I've heard, and I can't remember who the quote is from, but I'll tell you who told me the quote. And it's this dude, Trace, in town um, in Austin. He, I think he's the manager at Dub Academy, fantastic academy. I'm Trace is going to be coming on the show. We're going to do, be doing an in-person podcast. I can't fucking wait to do that. Dude is insanely knowledgeable. But the quote, and I'm probably going to butcher it, is something like, if you want to know where your values, where your values stand, Look at your bank statement, and it's 100% true. If you go look at your bank sp statement, look at what you're spending money on, look at the past month, the month before that, you'll quickly find patterns and realize, oh shit, you know what? No wonder why I can't buy this isotope plugin that I really want to get or this fab filter plugin that I really want to get. It's because I'm going out every single week and spending $100 on drinks and parking and 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 shows or or video games right i'm spending fucking 200 dollars a month on new video games that's why you can't afford that plugin that's why you can't afford that mixing service that's why you can't afford a photographer to shoot for you it's because your values stand in a different place and if you want to change that if you want to level up your craft if you want to be more professional have better stuff you need to make sure that you're really looking at that foundational uh, fundamental money management stuff. If your money is being spent in, on the wrong things, you're never going to be able to purchase the right things, the things you care about, the things you value, the things that are going to make your brand better. If you have tracks coming out every three months and you're still like, hi, I just don't have $50 to put into advertising. How do you not have $50 over three months? There's a way to save that up. There's a way for all of you listening now to save that up, unless you live in like a crazy poverty stricken third world country, uh, m most of you listening aren't because you don't nest, you don't have the ne necessity or the, um, I should say the, uh, you don't have the ability to sit around and write music all day, right? You're, you're trying to work towards those necessities. Most of you here can save up $50 to just run an ad campaign and test stuff out. Most of you could probably save up far more money than $50 to really test things out. But you, in order to figure out how to do that, you got to understand where your money's being spent and how it's being spent and how you could start saving money now to then use it later and invest in yourself. No one's going to take you seriously. That is serious in the industry, right? A label, a big label, um, a, a big promoter, a, a big photographer a big producer, none of them are going to take you seriously if they don't see that you're taking yourself seriously. And that means your marketing's on point, your branding's on point, you're paying for people to design your visuals, you're paying photographers 
good money to make sure that you have good shots. You're maybe you're paying someone to do your marketing for you. It doesn't matter. The thing, the point is, is that when people look at your image and they see how you present yourself, if it looks professional and it looks like you're spending money on yourself, they're going to take you seriously because you look more serious. Headshots go so far in the world of marketing yourself. If you think about it, if you're ever scrolling through LinkedIn and you don't have to do this as like a, someone looking for a job. You can do this. Just pretend you're a recruiter and just scroll through a bunch of people that you know, like people you know have connections with, and then just look at their picture. And then you think to yourself, would I hire that person based on their picture? And most of the time, I think I'd say, no, that's their graduation picture from 2002. So like, it, it's, it speaks volumes. A picture is worth a thousand words. And your professional headshots are make or break. Like, if your artist photos are just your logo, I'm going to be inherently disinterested in your brand or what you are because I'm not interested. Like, I, I feel, even to me, and I trust me, I'm very amateur. <laughs> but when I see that, I think, holy shit, that's more amateur than me. <laughs> so it, it goes a long distance. I've seen it before. I've seen people have, like, their... Their artist headshot is like a, a a selfie of them in their dark studio, and it just like it, it unless you're trying to go for that weird like indie vibe, like oh I'm you know I'm I'm just me to a fault, and you know if you don't like me then fuck it, and uh, yeah I'm working towards this dream, and I want all these people to like me and and follow me, but you know what, if you don't like my fucking selfie that looks like shit, then fuck you. It's like, it, it just, it looks obnoxious. It doesn't look good. It, you Having professional shots is a lot of the times how you're going to be able to sell yourself to promoters, right? If you have a really good EPK with really good photos and really good um, uh, uh, text in there, right? A lot of really good copy, which if you don't, if you're not good at writing copy, you can go on Fiverr and pay someone $50 to write a really good copy for you, for your artist description. Add that to your EPK. Fiverr will do so much at a great it, amount of money. And that will, that alone, having a great EPK with great photos of you that represent you and the artist project that you're working on with copy that represents you and the thing that you're trying to drive. That's the stuff that promoters are looking at that they're going to be like, we should bring this person in for this show. Sure, they may not may not be paying you $500 for a show. Sure, you might be opening doors and there's going to be 20 people in the crowd. It doesn't matter. The point is, is at least you have a foot in the door and you may not be able to get that foot in the door without that great EPK because you don't have the connection or the relationship established. So presenting yourself is the way that you're going to garner trust and you're going to be able to establish that initial relationship. Yeah. And I mean, I just can't get over the fact that like some of these artists, they'll brand themselves. And you have to think about it like this. Fred again, he's he's the newest craze. He's like he's taking over the dance music world with with his sound now. His he does the indie vibe right. So like there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. And it just all comes down to how much dedication are you going to put to it and like are you going to make it look good like presentable good is good it's right presentable is, is it like good is good and you know it when you see it um on top of that like all these people all these artists create a brand that really relates to them and like the it's a symbiotic relationship right so if you find something to build your brand around it'll work both ways because over time, you'll develop kind of quirks and niches, and you'll find niche followers and, and other stuff like that. It'll just help you progress down the line. A lot of DJs in America nowadays, they're thriving on the college scene. So they're like, they're building their brand on that frat boy personality. And I mean, we have so many DJs in America now who live off that, and they just tour colleges and they make tons and tons of money and trips. And it's just, it's all you have to do is associate a brand and, and integrate into it, and then you're golden. One of the best things you can do, and LaRuke, again, Shell gave me this advice last night, is finding 
If you don't know what your brand is or you're struggling with it or you want to rebrand or you just want to enhance your brand, one of the best things you can do is find a brand developer or an identity designer. And those individuals, you pay them a, a specific fee. You tell them who you are, what you're doing and, and how you want it kind of this this idea to be designed. And they'll essentially put together like an entire uh, what's it, like, per, style yeah, guide. like a style guide or like a proposal type thing where they'll say, here are the four different logos I designed. Here is the concept of what it would look like on a T-shirt, what it would look like on a, a hat, um, what your website might look like, just what your brand identity would look like. And that's going to help you get a bigger overall idea of the vision that you're trying to create because again most of us are not that those types of creative people where we can design a brand very easily very quickly that works and is going to um is going to stick with the masses so finding someone where it is their job to develop a, a unique brand that does stick to the masses is going to be step number one. Even if you've already been working on an artist project for three years and you you aren't that big and you're just unsure of where your brand is at or where you want to take it, finding some of these individual people and having a consultation with them and figuring out if they can nail it for you, it's going to do wonders for you. It's going to get, it's going to help center you to help you figure out like, is this the path that I want to go? If it is, okay, sweet. Now I have more of a better idea of where I need to take things, where I need to take my production, where I need. Yeah, yeah. It just saves you so much time, especially time in the sense that you're no longer needing to worry. Like, are my brand assets good? Is my logo good? Are my are my colors right? Like, you don't have to worry about that now because you had it professionally done and vetted by someone who's been doing it for years. And that's that plays right into the investment stuff because it, it will cost you money to do something like that. But you know that you're going to get a great product out of it and you're going to have a really solid brand once you're done. Right. And if you really think about it, and this is uh, like an, an analogy I can use, is <clears throat> Amazon subcontracts so much work when they do things. They hire a professional for everything. They hire professionals to optimize their logistics, to run their their factories or their manufacturing or rather um, their warehouses um, run their delivery logistics. Everything they do is optimized and subcontracted out to somebody who is the best in the business at what they do. So you should be investing in the best that you can get to make you the best that you can be. Best headshots, best marketing advice, best, best mixing, uh, advertising best mastering, tools, but best mixing and mastering like that you don't have. This is something, you know, I, I've crammed down all of your throats for years. Now you don't have to do everything. You don't have to design your own logo. You don't have to design your own visuals. You don't have to do all your mixing. You don't have to, you don't have to do all that. If you want to, and you want to learn a new skill, by all means, go do it. If that's what you're interested in. But do not feel like you have to do all these things to be a full artist because no one that is a full artist is doing all of those things. There are specific people that do specific things because they're the best at that thing and it makes the project better. So don't don't hurt yourself or hinder yourself because you're not willing to let the ego go and hire someone that is the best at what they do to make yourself better. It's what any uh, great president would do. Hire a great cabinet. <laughs> but we're not, we're not going to go any further than that. Um, I actually have a bonus sixth uh, tip. So this is actually five tips plus one. Um, try out everything and anything. One of my closest producer friends, he just, he used to be a future house and like, yeah, future house producer. Now he's doing techno, and his techno is the best stuff I've heard he ever make. And we're going to play a techno show in about a month, and it's probably going to be insane because his talent's unimaginable right now. So he loves it. He says he's found new inspiration. You should try out everything you can, and maybe, just maybe, something that you thought you weren't vibing with is really your vibe. Yeah. I think this also speaks to what I just said in the sense of, you know, it speaks against it. I should say I'm going to be 
slightly hypocritical here, but there's a point to it. And that point is you shouldn't do everything in your brand, right? You shouldn't design your entire, you, you shouldn't have to design all of your stuff shouldn't have to mix all your stuff. You shouldn't master all your stuff. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try it because you don't know if you're going to find a passion, something that you love, something that you can build a business in and have supplemental income. And you never know if you're going to be really good at something. You should try it all. Doesn't mean you should do it all, right? There's a complete difference between doing it all and at least trying it all and trying things and dabbling in things. Because you never know if you're going to find out that you're actually really good at designing visuals. And now all of a sudden you go, can go out to all your producer and DJ friends and say, hey, I'll design visuals for you, $100 a project or whatever you're going to be charging, right? Um, and, and all of a sudden, in three years, you're the visual guy. You're the person that everyone in town goes to for visuals. Right, like they, they start leaving on tour, like that first guy you did visuals for, and they start going on tour, and bam, you are now producing visuals for a main stage yeah, artist. Yeah, you like, never you never know if you're going to find that thing. So trying out as much as you can, producing different genres, mixing different genres, mastering other people's music, designing logos, like play around with all that stuff because you don't know if you're going to find something that you love, you're actually really good at. Um and you're also not going to know if you need to hire someone for something until you try it, right? If you write your EPK and realize this is not that good, means you should probably go go hire someone. And you might not have known that until you actually did it. So um, try it out. If it doesn't work, move on to the next thing and hire someone for that specific project. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, it. That's a solid wrap yeah, on it. That's a yeah. great wrap, dude. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for hanging out. Do you got anything to plug? Yeah. Um technically as of right now i shouldn't be releasing this but knowing how this episode will not be released tonight uh i should be safe it'll actually it'll well it'll be released on friday so ah, you might want to hold off uh, eh, that's okay. fine that works um basically if you guys are interested in anyone in the brooklyn new york city area i don't know if your demographic has anybody in there but um april 8th i will be playing a show back to back with one of my buddies bugs he's a really insane producer from philadelphia we're going to be uh, playing some trance, techno, and uh, melodic house. It's going to be a really crazy show. Follow me on Instagram, at Mike Vaughn DJ, and uh, you'll see some ticket links and some posts about it, and hopefully I'll see you guys there. Hell yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening. Head to enviousaudio.com slash episode 101 to check out the show notes. Click all the links that we talked about. Follow the people we talked about, and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.